Hello and welcome to Anatomy of Us, a show dedicated to bringing real help to real couples. I'm your host, Melanie Studley. What's up, guys? My name is Seth Studley. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and together we are high-performance marriage coaches. We are cutting through the bullcrap and creating a movement of happy, healthy, badass couples all over the world. Let's go! Today's show is brought to you by Women's Group Coaching. Go to anatomyofus.com forward slash women's group coaching to learn more. And women... I want you in these groups. We meet once a week. We have weekly prompts and monthly themes. It is an absolute game changer for community building, for living the life that you want to live. And I want to see you there. You can apply at anatomyofus.com forward slash women's group coaching. I love meeting weekly with these ladies and I know that you're going to love it too. Again, visit anatomyofus.com forward slash women's group coaching and I will see you there. This episode contains explicit language that is not very good for tiny ears. So if you're with your kids, put your headphones on. Take it away, Mom and Dad. (laughs) It's time for the show. Let's go. Welcome to the show, guys. What's up? So you insist on going first, have no idea what we're talking about, and then do that? Okay. Yeah. All right. So today we are answering a listener question. This is kind of a tough one. Mm. People might get upset, but Mm. we're going to go for it. Okay, here we go. All right. I recently found out that my husband was having two cyber affairs, primarily sexting. To my knowledge, he has never met up with either one of these women um, since we've been together, but unbeknownst to me, he did have a sexual history with both of them. One was a former friend with benefits. The other one was some sort of undefined cyber sexting relationship. We both have started couples therapy and individual therapy in our marriage. It's not that my husband wasn't getting any and decided to go for other women and wasn't because I wasn't available for him. In fact, I would describe Mm -hmm. myself as being the higher desire partner prior to finding this out. Um, We've we've been learning that his long-term porn addiction combined with shame and lack of understanding intimacy led him to make these choices. His family of origin does not have many, if any, examples of affection and intimacy. I feel so incredibly rejected since he sought a sexual connection with other women. Mm. Um, it says he has specifically denied me dozens and dozens of times sexually, including when I was out of town, and he said he felt awkward sending sexy, pi- sexy pictures to each other. Do you have any advice for me slash him slash us or for us as a couple? Mm. So thank right. you for sending this in. Yes, thank Challenging you. question. It is challenging. Thank you for sending it in. And people make it through these things, right? In my history or experience with couples counseling, individual therapy, all this stuff, people do make it through. From the ashes, in fact, one of our friends has from the ashes, from the ashes beauty, right? And it's his story of, of ashes to beauty. So there are plenty of examples of people making it through this. And in fact, thriving on the other side. Mm-hmm. I think we went something, obviously, super duper shitty. Right. Now we're... Oh, ah! my gosh. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? Your elbow will the show is never over. be the same. My elbow just went through something super oh, shitty. my gosh. That, that hurt. <laughs> really bad. So anyway, we went through something very difficult, challenging, and I feel that it was... We went like metal, you know, like into the crucible. Forged in fire. All the sloss sluice rises to the top you you know the dross it's not sloss it's dross uh it gets gets scuffed away and then boom you have something more pure stronger more excellent and it feels a whole lot better that's the process we went through sometimes still going through it refining but this is an opportunity for you guys to make the mess into your your message of of hey we went through something shitty and we're out of it we're on the other side and you can be stronger from it so I have some ideas about that from the mental health kind of family of origin Mm -hmm. side, but what is your immediate take on it? Um, Well, I think that there's a lot of things to focus on. One of the things I like what you're saying, like you can get through this, you can get on the other side of it. Uh, Immediately when you said that, I think setting your intentions, both of you, plurally, Mm. setting your intention for how you want to go through this is really important. Like, deciding that we're going to go through this and be really strong. And then on the other side of this, this is how we're going to be as a couple. And when we get there, we're going to feel like this. Like you can't predict all of those things, but you can make a lot of them. There is a fly just dancing around my face. So forgive me if you see a fly in my face. Uh, But there is a lot to be said for, I want to go through this season of our lives, our marriage or whatever, 
like this. And on the other side, I want to feel like this. Mm -hmm. That is, it does sort of two things. One, it helps you almost create the path. Like it, um, it'd be like saying, Hey, I want to drive from here to New York, but I want to take the Southern route. It's Mm -hmm. the scenic view, right? It's not the quickest one, but I want to do that one. And here's why I want to see, I don't know, this site and that site. El Paso, Texas. I want to see El Paso, Texas. But uh, if you're like, well, I just need to get to New York. I don't know. You could go up and down the whole country, right? Mm -hmm. So having like any idea will start to shape a path to get there. But then really, I think the most important thing is it sets an intention of like, oh, and I want to feel really good on the other side. Or I want to go to this place in New York and have the special thing that they eat there. And that's how I want to feel. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're setting a path, setting an intention, starting to create a path for yourself and then having an outcome that you want to see. With There's the goal a lot in mind, of right? things mm-hmm. that that does that are beneficial that pretty much no one teaches you to do that, mm-hmm. I would say. Um, so that's one thing that I want to share. The second thing I wanted to share was that I think in this situation, now, full disclosure, we know these people. So we know they haven't been married super long. I think that there is something to be said. And I think that this happened in our marriage because we weren't married very long when all the S hit the F. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, So I think that what happens is people are individuals before they get married. You have your own life. You do your own thing. You've experienced your own stuff, whether that's in, you know, your teens or your early child, whatever it is, whether that's trauma, whether it's whatever. Mm -hmm. You've experienced these things separately. Now you're merging two different lives together, two families of origin together, two life experiences together, and you're trying to make sense of it. You're trying to go like, how do we do this thing? How do we do that thing? But there's a lot of stuff that you don't explicitly communicate. You point. Getting point. married creates in both people an instant and acute adjustment disorder. Now, if you don't know what that is, adjustment disorder is a DSM diagnosis that I've diagnosed a zillion people with that. We've had them before. It's not like a huge thing, but there's a a couple different caveats. Adjustment disorder with um, uh, mixed emotions, depression and anxiety, Uh, adjustment disorder with um, uh, mood stuff. There's there's a whole like a couple things. And I was just thinking of this, taking two worlds and colliding them. I'm thinking Mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, the uh, uh, apartment Jerry George versus like fiance George on Seinfeld. Oh, yeah. And the worlds collide kind of thing. So it's like, Getting married is an instant adjustment disorder. Well, let me just read it. It says, an adjustment disorder is an emotional or behavioral reaction to a stressful event or change in a person's life. Boom. And it says, so an adjustment disorder is the reaction is considered as an unhealthy or excessive response to the event or change within three months of it happening or Mm -hmm. whatever. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so of course there's difference of uh, varying degrees of adjustment disorder. It's like, like signing up for a lifetime of adjustment disorder. No, because <laughs> hel- healthy you would you would address whatever's going on, you know, get over the hill, and then then right. have have back to Jeez. get kind of back to baseline, right? And by doing that, you go to therapy, you sign up for groups, you do coaching, you do you have accountability, right? Mm-hmm. Which these guys are doing, which is rad. But I just thought of that. Yeah, it's like. My world just turned upside down. Mm-hmm. We get married. There's a thousand people here, whatever. Family, all that stressful. Stress and everything. Then you go on a honeymoon. Then you're back in the apartment or wherever you live mm-hmm. and go, whew, whoa, okay, what do we do? Well, right? and it's like every day is an adjustment disorder for if you don't, if you're not on, on, in front of it and on top of it and aware of it and all that stuff. And again, I mean, I love, I actually really like that reframing of calling it an adjustment disorder because. Without that, so it's like the awareness is curative thing that right. whatever they their names are say, uh, Les and Leslie Parrott. Like, I don't know if you can start to say, oh yeah, that's what's going on. Like this is a huge stressor, uh-huh. not knowing how to navigate these things. And you begin to normalize it too. Right. I was with a new client yesterday, and he was describing something, and I was like, let's normalize this a little bit, not condone it. Say, well, I would have done that too, or like, yeah, she deserved that, or he deserved it. No. Okay, this is a fairly typical reaction to a stimuli mm-hmm. in some way, right? Mm-hmm. Now, where it gets messed up is, oh shit, I am not adjusting well. Mm-hmm. I'm super stressed out. I have crazy anxiety that's affecting other areas of my life, or I'm getting depressed more and more and more every single day. Mm-hmm. That is when it's time to get some outside help. That's when the adjustment disorder, and of course, don't get me sideways. I'm not saying getting married, boom, you instantly have a disorder, right? Right, A DSM mental health diagnosis disorder. I'm not saying that. It is... Diagnosed with marriage. Diagnosed with marriage. Yeah, marriage diagnosis. Diagnosis spouse. It's terminal. 
no coming back. Till death do us part. Right. But, uh, okay, but going back to the, the, the family of origin stuff and... Well, may I finish what I was saying that you interrupted? Uh, oh, let me think. Mm, should I let you finish? Mm. All right, continue. You have permission. <laughs> Not sure what just happened here. Um, Comedic relief. So I thought you said committee relief, and I'm like, I don't know what he's saying, but you said comedic relief. So what I was going to say that I was so rudely interrupted about is this idea that you're bringing, you're merging together these two family of origins, two individual lives, two individual stories, and then you're having to simultaneously like try to make meaning of and make sense of mm -hmm. your previous existence while creating and co-creating a new existence. Mm -hmm. It's a very tall order, folks. It's a lot to navigate and to manage and to know how to do things with and to think through. And I think that it would do our society and couples a lot of justice or it would help them a lot to be like, hey, folks, this season can be really messy. Can be. Now, it isn't always but sometimes it's like, th this is typically when I think most couples, now tell me if you think this is wrong. Mm -hmm. It's either first when they first get married or when they first start having kid kids, rather, mm -hmm. um, that the sort of all the skeletons come out of their closets and they're trying to grapple with them or shove them back in or that's the term, right? Skeletons in the closet. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was afraid I was saying it wrong. Um, but... It's like you're trying to make sense of it and either you know how to make sense of it with somebody mm -hmm. or you know how to hide it. And so you just keep hiding it and it like compounds itself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, now you're making me think about like how Brene Brown talks about shame. Mm -hmm. And we see this with clients all the time. I think we've seen it in our own marriage. It's like you're, you're trying to adjust to something, right? So a stressor comes in, right? Something new, something stressful, something... It doesn't even have to be bad. You right. know, I mean, a lot of people do do something good. Then we hit an up, upper limit problem. Mm. Then we learn to self-sabotage because we don't know what to do with all the money that's coming in. Right. We don't know what to do with like, a happy holy shit, or I'm, whatever. I'm happy. We're having sex mm. again. Uh, uh, do something Ooh. nuts. Do something crazy, right? So a lot of this is around shame. And Brene Brown's work is awesome. If you haven't read Brene Brown, um, what is her Braving, daring to be great? Braving or, the wilderness? Courageous. I don't know. Something, Braving. something great. Brene Brown, just look her up. Uh, we're like, oh, wait a minute. This isn't a normal response to a, a fairly normal stimuli. I should be, I have some sort of preferred view of myself in mind. Oh, I'm stronger than that. I'm better than that. Folks like me don't do that kind of or thing. Or I can't handle that. Or I can't or... handle it. And then you go, oh, you backpedal and go, no. And then you just dig yourself into a hole. And then, of course, there's more shame on that. And then once there's more shame, you do the thing that you were doing in the first place that gets your mind off the shame for a minute. And then it's just a, a, a mm -hmm. cyclical pattern, mm -hmm. right? That goes back to family of origin. It can go back to all kinds of things. But I want to normalize this whole process. Not normalize bad behavior. I'm not doing that but if we can detach ourselves just for a minute and go, oh, okay, so in my own family of origin, like my dad has done some things that I don't understand. I'm like, what is that? I don't, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, right? It's hurtful, but either I can go, oh my goodness, this should never have happened, one, mm -hmm. resisting it, not accepting it, which doesn't help anything, right? Um, number two, just being super mad and pissed and hurt and be like, all right, peace out, done, over. Do you have a pen? I need to take notes. Or three, um, okay, acknowledge the problem. Hey, what's going on here? This hurt my feelings. Uh, can we talk about this? Let's get to the root of it. Um, not, and also get to the root of the feelings, but before that, not internalize the feelings. Oh, if I would have been X, Y, Z then they wouldn't have X, Y, Z. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? I don't know. What, no. Say okay. The, if, if, if I, oh, I must be a bad son because of stuff with me and my dad, right? Oh, yeah. I'm like, hmm, okay, I'm not going to internalize that or I must be ugly and dumb and the worst because my husband or wife, like, talk to somebody else, right? right? Not The key is not to internalize that, but to say, hey, 
this is not okay within the bounds of this relationship. It's definitely not what I expected, mm -hmm. and I want to get through it and move forward stronger, right? Conflict avoided is conflict multiplied. And even with the thing I was talking about my, with my dad, I was like, I know I got to call him. I know that I have to talk about this, mm -hmm. right? And we did. Did it end up how I wanted to? No, not at all. Mm -hmm. But at least I called and addressed it, mm -hmm. right? So I have some clarity and closure in my mind to a degree. So... What was I saying there? I knew you were going to say that. So, what was I saying? And well, back to you, Mel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello, Diane. <laughs> um, this makes me... So, I wrote down in this, and it reminds me of what you're saying uh, within, with your relationship with your dad even, but it's like what you're... Again, we are coming at this differently than probably we normally would because we know these folks and care about them and have some insights that we're not sharing, but... Again, I could trace this back to even what we went through and what I've seen other friends go through, that this to me feels like the mess of healing oneself mm -hmm. to create a we, right? Like right. the mess that it takes sometimes when we've had messy lives and to heal that so that it's not perpetuated. Because I think what's happening with Seth and his father is being perpetuated. It's actually not being healed. There's only one partner or one person in the relationship actively working, really trying to heal that. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that <clears throat> this couple can both actively say, we both want to change this. We want to do it different. And looking at what happened as, again, the messy journey of healing oneself so that you can create a new and healthier we together. Because otherwise, if this work, if this ha so. When I found out, when Seth and I went through all the stuff that we went through, I wrote a song called Clueless. Mm. And um, it, one of the lyrics is like, why couldn't you break your own heart and leave me clueless? Like, why did you have to even tell me what you were doing? Why couldn't you just leave me out of this? Like, can't you just screw your own self up and let me be myself and mm. whatever? And I, 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 I love that song. But... um. I remember that feeling so strongly of like, well, F you because you brought this and you put it on top of me and now I have to manage it. It makes me hate who I am. It makes me hate who you are. It makes me hate the life we have. I can't believe how you have ruined me, right? But this thing you're listening to right now, 500 episodes later, this thing that got us flown to LA twice, that got us considered to be, you know, the, the Ramsey teams were talking to us. Mm -hmm. This thing that we do as a full-time job came from that. Mm -hmm. Had Seth not told me, we wouldn't be here. Now, mm -hmm. I use our story as my catalyst for growth. Had he not told me, I wouldn't have grown. So that is a thing. I've told that to this specific lady who wrote the question in, actually. I said... One thing I wish someone would have told me at the beginning of this process is that you are going to absolutely love the woman you meet on the other side of it if you do the work correctly. Mm. I love who I am now, and I would have not been anything like I am now had Seth not told me and we not worked on it together and not had that like, do you know what I mean? That like you team. Can, uh, yes, I do know what you mean. I take that very seriously. And also I want to make a joke is like, you can thank me later. Like that joke. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. Also, I told this to a client last week. If you're going through hell, keep on going. Right. Right. Yeah, we don't stop. we could have stopped a and most million people times. Do. Most people do. It's right. like it's like that uh, think and grow rich thing about the two like gold miner guys. Um, one guy sold all his stuff, bought a claim, found a little bit of gold, gave up after a year or something, like ran out of money, and then another guy had a scientist come in geologically survey the land. This is a true story, by the way. And then said, no, this has all the markers for like a, 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 huge, a huge deposit deposit of gold. And the guy started up where the other guy left off two weeks later, like found one of the biggest gold right. things or wasn't ever. it silver? It was like a silver. No, it was gold. But, but it point, was like, the, he the was like is, three inches away from like the first guy stopped. Right. And had he gone like literally inches farther mm -hmm. from where he stopped, and, he and, would have hit this massive So I, I talked to clients going through similar things all the time and I'm like I know it's hell mm. I know what it feels like to well a lot of stuff want to die for sure 
want to give everything up, want to quit everything, and waking up and having two seconds of like, oh, peace, and then remembering the hell and shit that your life is currently, mm-hmm. because that's what it was, and it was like that for every day for like a year and a half. But what did we do? We both kept on going. If you're going through hell, don't stop. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's burning. It's hot. This stinks of sulfur. <laughs> Whatever hell looks this like. Stinks of sulfur. Oh man. Fire and brimstone what, simply everywhere. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna stop? Well, okay. If you do, then is you'll that gnashing of teeth. I hear. Ooh, hello. You'll still be there, right? But, and because I, we know these guys, we both know that they are committed to mm-hmm. the whole process just like we were. Now, sometimes it was, a, it was 99% Seth doing awesome, 1% Melanie. Other times, it was 99% Melanie, 1% Seth. And we had that like dance. That was just basically a, a two-year long dance. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you carried it, sometimes I carried it, but we were both committed to carrying it. Fully, right? And I know that you guys are committed to the same thing, but what did we do? We read zillions of books. We had a therapist around us. We had a community around us because we couldn't have done it alone. Mm-hmm. And we had family around us that really helped as well. So for this, I want to go back to what you were saying, how this is like, it goes back to like individual healing, mm-hmm. right? Because we all have our stuff, family of origin, shame, all We all have our stuff. Not one single person comes into a marriage without their own stuff, right? And the number one thing that our struggle highlighted was how goofy and hurt and not a clue we both were individually, right? If you pulled both of us out of the marriage and just looked at our hearts and brain, you'd be like, what is Seth thinking? Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. He's got shame. He's got doubts. He's got some real goofiness in there. He's got some anxiety, what is that? What's going on, right? Apart from Melanie, same thing. Yeah. Like shame, like anxiety, like all kinds of stuff, mm-hmm. right? And entitlement, all kinds of stuff, right? And we bring that into the marriage and that didn't get healed. <sighs> Honestly, it didn't even get a light shed on it until we started going through the heavy shit. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, we'd have arguments and stuff, but we were never like, oh my gosh, I have to... I have right. to fix me, it, everything. Yeah. I'm going to use, I said this in our women's group coaching about um, husbands, actually. It was really funny. Hmm. I said, you know, sometimes, and, and this is going to apply to us in early marriage. Um, mm-hmm. It's like we were toddlers riding around emotionally on um, a like a tricycle. Like that's how we were emotionally when we first got married, both of us. It wasn't just Seth or just me or whatever. You bring two toddlers into a room together on their, on their tricycles with their suckers. And that's like what we were capable of handling. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I don't know. I just think there's a lot to say, like, that is what you're moving out of. That is what you're graduating from. And unfortunately life is challenging. And sometimes our spouse brings in a challenge. Reframe that. It's not, unfortunately, it's what it is. Right. That's true. It comes with its struggle. It comes with its wisdom, its victory, Mm -hmm. all that stuff. And I swear to G marriage uh, so nothing you... else in the world has brought those things that we both had to work on couple wise and individually as marriage. You know, it's like, boom, in, in the hot lava Mordor fire every single day. What am I going to learn today? What am I going to learn today? And having the mindset of this is happening for me, not to me. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is happening for me to grow. Shit. Oh, it hurts so right. bad. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Mm-hmm keep on going. Right. Right. And so I, again, too, I think of this idea of like cast a vision of what you want to look like on the other side of this. So if this is something that you are going through that you've, you know, you discovered something in your marriage that you didn't think would happen or you're having some, whoever it is, I'm not just talking to the person who wrote this and I'm talking generally to everybody, figure mm-hmm. out who you want to be on the other side of that, figure out how, what you want to look like one year from now. So like if it's me and Seth a year from now, Melanie, you know, let's say we're going through something super hard. And in a year from now, I want to be able to look back and say, damn, I handled that beautifully. It was a hard situation and I handled it really well. Mm-hmm. Or I grew in these ways and I, I, you know, improved my life in these ways. I grew my relationship in these ways. Like we can handle hard things mm-hmm. and we can handle hard things really well. And we can walk through things again. I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning of what I was saying though. Like I wish that someone had reframed these things in marriage, not as like a personal attack, like, oh, 
Seth did this thing because you suck and that's what's happening. It's this, it's that. It's like, no, this is just us trying to make sense of two separate lives that we lived before we were married. How do we merge them together in marriage with new expectations, new hopes, new dreams, new whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we were going through. All of the stuff ha stuff happened in our marriage in the first like five years. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't like we had been married for 20. That bug is like in love with the lens. I hope it lands on the lens and just looks its, it's eyes into the lens. Let's start charging that bug rent. <laughs> anyway. He's using uh, our studio. Right. Um, <laughs> what, one thing that I want to say, you were talking about, have a vision in your mind of, of what you want to be mm -hmm. one year from now, six months from now, one week from now even. And there's this exercise by... And that, sorry, that's both of you too. Not just the wife. Oh, not, not just, just the wife. It's it both of you. Absolutely so, both sorry, of you, going. right? Uh, both of you individually, and then mm -hmm. you come together and have a, a conversation mm -hmm. of the shared vision. Right. Right? So this wonderful e exercise, it's called the... Uh, I, I don't know if it's this or not, but it's what I named it. Maybe it is this. It's the I'm so happy dot, dot, dot exercise. And it comes from an exercise by Bob Proctor. Go listen to anything Bob Proctor. He's amazing. I love him. Anyway, uh, the I'm so happy exercise. Imagine your life, and I created this exercise. In fact, I shared it with the men at uh, the Badass Husband live event. Go to badasshusband.com for more info. Get on the application, see if you're a good fit. And it is the I'm so happy exercise, and you, you language it like this. I'm so happy that we are, are making X amount of money per month. Mm -hmm. Get specific. I'm so happy that we can have... I'm so happy that we're having great conversations about spirituality, health, parenting, kids, sex, intimacy, career. I'm so happy that you and I are getting along together mm -hmm. so well. I'm so happy that I uh, took a big leap and have my dream job. I'm so happy that I've grown as a husband. I'm so happy that I'm working through family of origin issues mm -hmm. and getting closer to myself, my dad, my brothers, my sisters, my mom, anything like that. So what are you doing? You're projecting into the future of what you want to see. And then your brain hears that and goes, all right, brain, let's go. Let's start reverse engineering. Just like I said, I remember it was like mm, March, February, April of 2020, right when all the COVID stuff was shutting down. And I was like, okay, this is, this is kind of scary, right? Like our kids were out of school for two weeks, then they extended that to a month. And then two months, and we're like, whoa, this is real. They're not going back to school this year. Yeah. And it was like February, so mm -hmm. all this stuff was new. And I had the mindset of, I didn't even told you about it. I'm like, oh yeah, I want to look back one year from, you know, I want to look back to February 2020 and say February 2022, 21, hey, we weathered that pretty good. Right. We didn't lose our shit. We took precaution. We, you know, followed whatever best mm -hmm. protocols. We didn't go crazy and think, oh, this is just the worst. What do we do? And then do, you know, be like sheep and everything else and get a hundred uh, uh, booster shots or anything stupid like that. But it's like a hundred booster shots is not stupid in case that's what you did. Just FYI, keep talking. A hundred probably is excessive. Well, yeah, anyway, um, uh, I looked in the, into the future of how I wanted to look back of the past, mm -hmm. right? You even said, I will correct you on this. You said, you wanted it. You wanted to look back and see that we had grown. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, oh, I just want to do it well. It, I don't right. want to just like skim by, make it. Mm -hmm. It was more like, no, I want to look back and be like, we actually grew. We made more money. We had more clients. We had better relationships. That was the request or the. Essentially, what you're saying and, is affirmations. So there is a book. Oh, affor. The there is a book called the Little Book of Affirmations, and I can't remember where. But it's not affirmation, it's affirmation. So A F F O R M A T I O N S mm -hmm. by Noah St. John. I can't remember where I saw it or where I heard of it, but I got it on, I listened to it on Audible. But it's this idea of like, you ask yourself a question. This is what is so cool about it. Your brain loves to answer questions. So, mm -hmm. like, that's, you know, kids ask questions endlessly. Little kids, why is it that? Why isn't that? Why aren't you this? You know, like all the time. Why is an elephant have a trunk? Blah. Like uh, our brains really like to answer questions, which says why sometimes we create answers that are false. Like, oh, well, yeah. you did that because you hate me. Right. You know, so I, mm -hmm. I made an answer to the question. Why would you do that? Well, he hates me. So our brains love to answer questions. So affirmations are a way of asking questions from the future you to the current you 
Things like, why do I have such an amazing marriage? So mm. right now you may have a very unamazing marriage, but you ask yourself, why do I have such an amazing marriage? As if it's like six months ahead and you go, man, why do I? And mm -hmm. then you go, oh, well, I know. We go on date nights every week. Mm -hmm. we, we schedule intimacy and, you know, blah, blah, blah. We do all the things that we are supposed to do. And that's why. So again, an affirmation is like asking yourself a question from future tense you to then give your brain a chance to answer it. So in this situation, it would be like, why did we get through that season so well? Why did mm -hmm. we get through discovering that my husband had had cyber affairs and denying me intimacy and making me feel bad? Why, why did we come out on the other side of that better than when we started, mm -hmm. which was, is a very hard thing to hear someone say to you, but Seth and I are better from what we went through than when we started again, toddlers on a tricycle with suckers was a, our emotional tolerance level, mm -hmm. our frustration tolerance level. And we're better now for having gone through the things that life will bring you anyway, right? Life brings hard stuff. So in a sort of in addition to having that vision of like, I want to get through this like this, and I want to feel better and I want us to be stronger. You can begin asking yourself from future tense you, how did we weather that so well? And your brain will come up with answers that you may never have thought of mm -hmm. if you just said, well, how can I get through this? Different question, right? Different vibe. Right. That makes sense? Absolutely. And I so, love it. yeah, I think it's interesting. And I do want to point out again, too, Seth talked about like if you're going through hell, don't stop. I think that that's so important to, I want to reframe it because, uh, and it, this will make sense in a minute, but like we've worked with people, many, many clients and people right into the show who have gone through hell. And maybe that was the first six years of their marriage, but they've been married for 20. Mm hmm. And they keep reliving mm. the first, you know, 24 years ago, they're stuck in that hell and they're bringing it into every passing day. They're pulling that hell into 2022, 2023, 2024. When it happened 20 or, you know, what did I say? How what was the math? I don't remember. I don't know. 24, 14 years 14, ago. I said all the math wrong. No numbers. Forget the numbers. But. So imagine that that, not imagine, this is what people do. And so I, I love you saying, if you're going through hell, don't stop. But also if you've gone through hell, don't bring it into every freaking room of your house. It's like taking uh -huh. a kid's stinky, a teenager's shoes. If you have a, a house with small bedrooms and your teenager takes their shoes off and sits in that room, it's like the scent Throw of- Throw it out the window. <laughs> it's the scent of like the Satan's but restroom. It's a Santa can of Satan. Mm -hmm. uh, and don't take that into all of the rooms of your home, all of the aspects of your relationship. If you've gone through it already, freaking let it go. Drop it off. Figure mm -hmm. out what you want to do with that. Because if it keeps on coming up, that means you have more work to do around it, mm -hmm. right? People talk that way about triggers like, oh, wait a minute. Okay, you're triggered. That is only a sign mm -hmm. that you may need to do more work around it or maybe you're doing yeah. things that are continually putting you back can in, i say in that something thing. you better hurry triggers. so there is a recent study i think it, huberman talked about it mm -hmm. not liking trigger warnings have you seen that or was that someone else i don't know so he was saying like when people are like trigger warning you're gonna see a thing of whatever he's like that is the opposite of desensitization right so if you if people are always like you know, tiptoeing around things. Oh, yeah. Then they will never become desensitized to the thing that used to be very abrasive to them. Right. And it does, it makes weak people. And oh, so, my gosh. So, yeah. Trigger warnings are like, you know, getting the 15th place trophy on a t ball thing, also. It's like, oh, you got 15th place. What good is that? Who is that doing a favor for other right. than like one little second of temporary nothing? So yeah, right. and trigger then, warning. Oh, okay. If you give a trigger warning to everything, you'll never face the thing and yeah. you'll never grow. Hey, trigger warning. You might sweat when you go to the gym. <gasps> I can't. You know? That was pretty funny. Give me a break. And now I do want to honor that some things are whatever. Well, yes, yes, you know, some things. Uh, whatever. Obviously. But mm -hmm. that, there is a lot to be said there. And that, that translates it directly into... Like for like my whole title of the song I wrote for you or, you know, about our relationship, mm -hmm. Clueless, why didn't you just not tell me? That's like the ultimate baby trigger warning. Don't just don't tell me. <laughs> didn't why didn't you give know. me a trigger warning? Right. Well, okay, fine. I, I, okay. Right. You're not stronger for it. In my family, they would be, they want a trigger warning for like fireworks. Just let me know when it's going to be loud. Like that's what they all are. That's what they all want. They tell me if there's a, a jump scare in the movie, my sister will be like, 
Yeah, it wasn't good. There was jump scares. I'm like, uh, you mean it's a movie? Like it's meant to make you feel a thing. You weren't, you know, anticipating. Speaking feeling. of scary movies, this is hilarious. I saw a meme today from one of my friends I used to work with. Um, and uh, it uh, oh, what did it say? It's like, oh, you know why no natives are in uh, horror movies? Because we always survive. <laughs> It was, it was kind of funny. It was like going back. But anyway, thank you for this question. I hope it is helpful. Um, get accountability around stuff. Uh, share your story. Uh, vul- being uh, vulner- vulnerable in that way is just sharing your story, and then other people can help you. You feel like you've taken off a heavy backpack full of rocks, mm-hmm. and keep on going. If you're going through hell, don't stop. Mm-hmm. Keep on going. Don't get stuck there. So, you guys, we love you. Go to... What are we promoting? Well, we're just not anything. We love you guys. Rate and review the podcast on iTunes. How about that? Promote that. All right, guys. Love you. Talk to you later. Bye. Peace. Thanks for listening to Anatomy of Us. This podcast is produced by my mom, Melanie Studley, and hosted by my dad, Seth Studley. Our show is edited and published by our producer, Reva Hansen, from Creative Media Support. Special thanks to our Patreon members that get an extra episode every week. Thanks for watching. Love you. Bye.